Yeah. I just, I can't believe public works. Okay, so um, we're going to start, we're going to do selections from this chapter. I can't remember the name in KFCS, but we're going to focus on sound and pipes. You know, the, this is, there's a lot of stuff in this chapter. I think the Helmholtz resonators in there, which we've already discussed. So we're going to focus on um, sound and pipes. And it's really appropriate because we're going to utilize a lot of the stuff we've, things are going to come together, a lot of stuff we've done this quarter. And uh, now that I think about it, we're also going to, some material from last quarter will be important and we'll be able to look more deeply into something you dealt with last quarter in 3119. Um, sound in pipes is important for a variety of reasons. It's a lot of physical acousticians. Oh, you guys remember there's all kinds of acousticians, right? Physical acousticians do the kind of basic physics, fundamental sort of physics. So I've done a lot of work in um, pipes. It's a nice controlled environment. You can have a simple wave, simple waves in there as we will see, and you can probably guess. And uh, so it's a highly controlled environment. Um, you can look at fundamental aspects of the theory. You can also determine, I don't do this, but you, you know, there are people who determine, like NIST people, that determine constants. You know, when we look up constants, a lot of thermodynamics constants, as I've mentioned to you, those are actually determined acoustically. That's the more accurate way to do it, rather than from some like thermodynamic, quasi-static thermodynamic experiment. Of course, you have to be careful. Acoustics is at some frequency. And so usually you're interested in, for thermodynamics quantities, the low frequency limit. So you have to be careful about that. But um, anyway, well, we've discussed that. Finally, um, you know, everybody loves music. It's, uh, you know, for at least 40,000 years. It's like, I, think they, I think I might have mentioned that to you. They found musical instruments that are 40,000 years old. and. Um, a, um, an issue that's been around for a century or so is what can, um, what can modern science and technology say about musical instruments that evolved due to craftsmen, right? Who didn't know anything about the science. They just kind of tw tweaked things. And, and uh, there's still, a, I think I might have told you this, there's still a very long way to go. Musical acoustics, it's called. So this, um, Pipes obviously relate to woodwinds. Right. Um, yeah. Oh, uh, there's another thing here. You'll see more of this in the next course, but this is the standard place to, encou to encounter waveguides. Standard waveguides in acoustical waveguides as well as electromagnetic waveguides are very common, especially on ships. and um, so we'll talk a little bit about, we're actually not going to talk about waveguides. That's in the next course, 3452. <coughs> Professor Kapok will be teaching that next quarter. Um, but this is a start. You know, we're going we're to mainly deal with sound waves and with radiation from the open end of a pipe. But it carries over into uh, waveguides. OK, so to begin, what we're going to do in the beginning, we're going to simplify the drive, simplify the drive mechanism. We will assume a completely ideal drive here. So this is a massless piston, and there's no stiffness. You don't see any stiffness there, and there's no uh, dissipation. There's no, there's no spring, and there's no dash pot, right? So we're going to take the simplest example here. This will lead to some strange results, but later on in this that chapter, we will become realistic with this. Uh, now, here's an important point. Oh, there's some arbitrary termination here. So we're going to call it uh, some mechanical impedance. It'll be characterized quantitatively by a mechanical impedance. That's what the little m stands for. It has general complex, of course, amplitude and phase. And the L stands for the fact that it's the, the termination impedance, what we call the termination impedance. 
And we're going to incorporate in our general theory, you know, it could be a rigid end, it could be an open end. We'll talk about that today. And it could be something in between. It could be this called what? What's this stuff called? Acoustical tile, right? You, is that, you've heard that? Maybe, you, maybe you've never heard that before? It's called acoustical tile. It's supposed to absorb some sound so that the room doesn't sound, sound like a Starbucks. Everybody's been in a Starbucks. We even have one on campus now, which still amazes people. <laughs> and you've, have you gone in there? Have you been in any Starbucks? What's the problem? Did we talk about this in this yeah. chapter six? Well, it has, Starbucks have all these hard surfaces and there's a lot of people in there talking and they're excited, they're drinking coffee, you know, caffeine, and it gets loud. Have you, have you noticed that? Well, <laughs> maybe for you, but not for me. I, I have only gone there in the off hours, you know, because I find it very loud in there. I have sensitivity, I have hyperacusis. I don't know if I've told you guys, it's called sensitivity to sound. But, um, yeah, so this is why people came up with this acoustic tile. This has some impedance. We used to do an experiment here where we actually put a plug of this stuff in the end of a tube and experimentally determined the impedance. It wasn't a great experiment. We eventually, we eventually abandoned it. But we'll be able to handle that in our theory here. Um, and that's incidentally another use for sound in tubes. Well, it's, we already mentioned it, to characterize this right here, where is it? To probe fundamental phenomena as well as measure values, you know, param constants. So that's another thing you can do here. They, this is a standard thing to use what's called a, a traveling wave tube. It's not really, it's also a standing. To use a tube like this and put some material here that you want to characterize acoustically. Okay, uh, now, one little thing here. We're only going to consider longi- uh, how do I say this? We're only going to consider sound waves, plain, plain sound waves that are perpendicular to the pipe here. And you might say, well, that's the only kind of sound in there. Uh-uh, there's another kind. Can you see how it can come about? The hint is think of higher frequencies. If you go to sufficiently high frequency, you're going to start to get variation across the tube then it's usually called a waveguide. Um, often people, when they talk about a waveguide, they're implying that you're at a high frequency where you have, as you'll see next quarter in 3452, a standing wave across here and typically a traveling wave here. Um, if this is, if it's infinite and you don't have any reflections here. So we're only gonna be dealing with plane, what we call plane waves in this. We're not gonna deal with the higher frequency waves where you can have variation across the tube. That's a, that's, that waveguide behavior is going to be a part of the next course. And one of the reasons it is is that there's a natural waveguide in the ocean, right? What's it called? SOFAR channel? N Navy people should know about that. You guys know about that? Submariners? Should know about it? Okay, right. So if whales beat us to it by a few million years, they know to utilize the SOFAR channel to communicate. Smart, right? Evolution. Um, all right. Uh, now, we're going we're gonna to deal with impedance here. It is overwhelmingly convenient to deal with. It's hard to imagine how to do the calculations we're going to do without dealing with impedance. And we're going to, the kind of impedance that we're going to deal with here is not a wave or characteristic impedance. Because we've got sound confined to this pipe, we're going to define it to be the complex force divided by the complex velocity. There'll be an impedance at the end here, for example. We're not going to take it to be the pressure. And this, we did the same thing for radiation impedance. We did the force rather than the pressure. Because the rate, like <coughs> the, of a piston, the relevant quantity that we have some area. So it's natural not to deal with the pressure which can be actually a complicated function on the face of the piston, but to integrate over that and deal with the force divided by the velocity. So we do the same thing here. It's going to be force divided by velocity. The, um, 
The terminating impedance has some, will have some impedance. This will be the force divided by the velocity. And it depends upon, you know, the nature of that, the acoustical nature of that termination. We're going to begin with considering the pipe to be lossless, but uh, later on we'll include losses in the pipe. And we know how to do that for losses in the bulk, right? We, that's, we, that was what we did last chapter. Now I need to warn you that typically in pipes, the bulk losses away from the boundaries are small, quite small, compared to the losses near the boundary. Due to the viscous penetration depth, the, due to the boundary layer, some of you know, may know from fluid mechanics. So if you do get involved in this later in research or whatever, um, I just want to warn you that you need to look, at, look up the wall losses section in KFCS, which we, didn't, we don't have time to cover. So right now we're going to consider it to be losses. So we know what the pressure is going to look like. We have this plane wave in there. In general, it's going to be a right traveling wave and a left traveling wave with some in general, complex coefficients. Now we've called these primes, you'll see why shortly, why we call these primes. We're going to transform these into more convenient coefficients. And let me remind you here that to have a solution, omega has to equal CK. You just can't have any omega and any K here. There's a fundamental relationship, the dispersion relationship there. Um, any, once we have a solution, we can of course scale it. This is linear acoustics. You know, twice, if I multiply this by two, that'll also be a solution. Um, but what's, so what's important here is actually the ratio of these two amplitudes. Not their overall values, because we can always scale this. What's important, and we've seen this before, is the like B, B prime over A prime. And uh, what specifies those boundary, what those, that ratio is going to be the boundary conditions at either end, as we, as we will see. Now we're imagining the game here, the goal sort of, is to, we, we, we model this, you know, and you know what we're eventually going to go to. We're going to have a harmonic oscillator, you know, a, a piston with mass and some stiffness and some uh, dissipation, some uh, damping. We want to uh, treat, we're going to treat this in general. We have in mind, like I said, closed ends, open ends, and something, you know, in between. So because we reserve the origin here to be the input point, we're driving this. There's going to be some input mechanical impedance. And we call this x equals L. But this has the general impedance. So it's convenient here. It's a little convenient to essentially shift our origin we're going to keep calling the input point x equals 0, because that's very standard, OK? But we can effectively, mathematically, shift our, our origin to make it easier to deal with by transforming the amplitudes as follows. And you know we can do this. These a and, a and b prime are, in general, complex. So nothing stops me from setting a prime equal to this. Okay, and B prime equal to that. Now you say, well, why would you do that? Well, the answer is, is in the answer. <laughs> when you do that in here, you can see that you end up with this. Now, if you look at this expression here, we again have a right traveling wave and a left traveling wave. But you'll see here that this has the form. Effectively, this becomes x equals L becomes the origin here. When we, we absorb it into here. So that turns out to make the math a little bit easier. So we'll do that. And now let's find the impedance at the end. <coughs> What's the force at x is equal to L? What's the pressure times the area? <coughs> pressure is uniform here, simple. So I evaluate our expression here at the end. We get this, easy to see that. We need to find the impedance. We need to take the force divided by the particle velocity, complex force divided by the complex particle velocity. It's all complex here. And now to get the velocity, we can get it from the linearized Euler's equation. Here's linearized Euler. We integrate this. It's easy to integrate. Everything's going you know, sinusoidally here. So the time derivative just introduces a 1 over i omega, right? When I integrate this with respect to time, 
So I've done this here. What's the partial of P with respect to X? Well, there's P. We have this explicit expression for P, so we just differentiate it. And then we evaluate at X equals L, and we get this expression here. And again, this is simple because we've effectively moved our origin. Okay. It, it's, this, the moving of the origin is not a real big deal, but it makes, just, it makes life a little simpler. Now, for a big point here, this is, I take the ratio of the force to the velocity. That's the impedance of the sound wave right at the boundary there. On the other side of the boundary from the acoustical medium is going to be an arbitrary termination characterized by some impedance, by, this, by some impedance that we call this, and this is complex. The impedance has to be continuous because the pressure has to be continuous and the particle velocity has, has to be continuous. We've talked about this several times before, right? So the impedance here in the sound field, just, at, just, just to the left of this termination here, has to be the same as the impedance of the termination. So we set the determinating impedance equal to the impedance of the sound field there, the force divided by the velocity, at the boundary, at the termination. We get this. Um, okay, so this is a relationship between the standing wave field that we have. Well, it can be a combination standing traveling wave field, as we will, as we will see, uh, ultimately. This represents the sound field in the pipe, it has to be equal to whatever terminating impedance we have there, whatever it may be. We can do the same math at the input point. Now the origin, we've effectively shifted the origin, so now it gets a little bit more complicated. There are, there are e to the plus or minus ikls that are floating around, and that's, it. that's the complication. So we're not going to do that, but it's a similar analysis to what we just did, just a little bit more complicated, and we get this. And you can see it's quite similar, right, except for these e to the ikls, and that's because we've effectively moved the origin over there, because it's just convenient because we want to deal with general terminating impedances. Okay, now we have these two relationships for the impedances. The sound field is characterized by A and B, but more accurately, it's, as I said before, it's the ratio of A and B. Because you, and you can see this, and we've been through this before. I can divide numerator and denominator by A here, and then I just get B over A. That's the important quantity, is the ratio. So we have these two equations, and we have a B over A ratio in each of them. We can eliminate B over A right now. Now, ultimately, it's, we want to get back to that because we may want to know what the sound field is actually doing in there. But for right now, to connect the input mechanical impedance with the terminating impedance, we eliminate the ratio there, okay? And, and this is, um, these are two linear equations in B over A, so this is simple to do. We've talked, we've s seen this before in reflection and transmission, this kind of idea. Um, here's what you get when you eliminate B over A here. We get that the input mechanical impedance divided by rho naught CS. Now this, this is, an, this is a, the impedance in the limit of short wavelength, you may remember. This has dimensions of impedance. So this is the dimensionless impedance. We naturally do things in terms of that, simplifies things. So. We get this box, this is an important relationship, that's why I put a box around it. This relates the input mechanical impedance to whatever the terminating mechanics, mechanical impedance is. KFCS, this is an important equation, we're gonna get a lot of mileage out of it. You actually encounter this in 3119. It happens in bars and, str and strings. So I'm, you probably don't remember, okay, but, it, it, but it's in there. If you look back, you'll see it. We're gonna get a lot of mileage out of this. Uh, Professor Baker calls it the impedance translation formula, which I think is a great name. KFCS don't give it a name, but it's so important, I think it's good to have a name. And the reason it's called this is if you, 
Often what happens here is this is specified. We've specified the terminating impedance. That tells us what the resultant input impedance is, translated the length of the tube. So the impedance that you see here, the input impedance that the external agent sees driving this pipe, is related, of course, to the terminating impedance. And it's related in a complicated manner. There's a lot of interesting behavior in here, as you will see, due to its complication. Um, and the first thing we should do here is to, to, to gain an appreciation for this. The impedance that you see is different than the impedance here because the, the pipe, the acoustics happening in the pipe. If there's no pipe, what do I have to see? I better see ZML, right? And sure enough, if you let L go to zero, that's one of the ways of doing this, I guess you could let rho go to zero. I've never thought about that before. But anyway, um, the simple way is to shrink the pipe up such that it's nothing. The tangent of zero is zero. Uh, this is zero. So do you see what you get? You get that the input impedance is identical to the terminating impedance, which has to be the case. The external agent there will see ZML, because it's right there. <coughs> okay. Uh, uh, we've seen this before. Of course, any complex number can be represented as the sum of real and imaginary parts. And in our case, this is a very physical thing. It's not just mathematical, <coughs> because the terminating impedance will have some resistive part. The real part's called the resistive part. That's where energy is dissipated. Um, right? That's one of the ideas of this the acoustical tile. The sound gets in there and gets dissipated. And then it'll have some reactive part. The reactive part, it doesn't involve dissipation. It involves you know, when you're driving this impedance, if, this, if the sound wave is doing it or some external agent is driving it, there's a, 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 a continual oscillation of energy back and forth here. So you're not losing energy, but over one cycle, sometimes energy is going in, sometimes it's coming out. And the average, the average flow of energy is zero because it's reactive. It's, it's like driving, like I told you before, it's like driving a capacitor, an ideal capacitor. There's no losses, but there's an impedance there. It's called reactance. It's a pure reactance. So these are very physical quantities for us, and we'll be dealing with them. And in fact, one of the ways we deal with them, let me remind you, from, this is from chapter three. This will probably ring a bell, what I'm about to say here. And if you didn't get it, I don't blame you. Um, it's, it's in this chapter that we will really see the importance of what's called resonance. And let me remind you that resonance is not such a simple thing that the way KFCS define it, in acoustics it's important to have a precise definition of resonance. There are way, different ways of defining it. Okay, there are different kinds of resonances out there. It's so important in acoustics we have to have a precise way. And so what KFCS do, and this is I think common in acoustics, is it's taken to be where the input, um, when the input reactance vanishes, does that ring a bell? That's the technical definition of resonance that you encountered last quarter. It's when x is equal to, oh, well, we have to replace this. Sorry, we need to replace this with the input, what's in, relevant for resonance. You're driving the system. So you see a certain input impedance. It's when the reactive part vanishes. That's the appropriate, proper definition of resonance. And you saw that in 3119 you're going to get to understand it in this chapter. You don't really understand it well there, but in here we'll see, um, we'll get a really good feel for it. Did you guys remember that, the vanishing of the input reactance? Does that sound, I'm not getting a lot of response there, okay. But anyway, we're going to see it, we'll see it here. It'll be very graph, literally graphical. <laughs> All right. So we've set, we've got this, we're setting up this machinery. We can start to calculate things here. But the first thing we ought to do is the, this, the simplest. This is not simple, so we want to do the simplest cases where it is, where it does become simple. So let's, the simplest kind of termination is a perfectly rigid termination, just a hard <coughs> wall there. We've got a pipe with a hard wall at the end. So the boundary condition there is there's no particle velocity. 
particle velocity has to be continuous, we can't have any particle velocity for linear acoustics, right? You know, if you have a liquid in there and if you have a big enough sound wave, you could get a separation. You could get cavitation, I guess, at the boundary. But that's highly nonlinear. For linear acoustics, as we've discussed before, we, the boundary condition here will be zero particle velocity. So if you look at the impedance translation formula, here it is, and you set, uh, oh, so what's, the, so what's ZML for a hard boundary? It's the force divided by the velocity. There will be a force. There's zero. It's, it's infinite. So for the hard boundary, we set the impedance here, ZML, equal to infinity. And if you do that, you can see this is going to become negligible compared to this. Uh, this will become negligible compared to that, technically as long as the tangent of KL is not zero. If the tangent of KL is not zero, it's, it's different, but that doesn't happen here. Um, uh, okay, that's actually a mistake, what I just said. Hold off on that. We're going to encounter that later, probably when we encounter anti-resonance. Do you guys remember resonance and anti-resonance? It comes up in the previous course, but it ne never really sticks, okay? And not just for students, for instructors too, okay? It never really sticks. We will encounter that here. Um, I have a note in the notes here, but we'll, we'll, we'll see this again later when we explicitly encounter it. I said a small input resistance leads to resonance, a large input re impedance. I can see that there's a little bit of mistake here. Uh, this should be this should be resistance, no big deal. Um, but we will see this later in the chapter, okay? And like I said, you want to look back at 3119, it's in there. It's in the strings or bars or something, you know, it's in there. One or both of those chapters, chapters that cover that material. But we're going to be able to really get into it here and understand it. Okay, well anyway, getting back to this impedance translation, the rigid boundary. <coughs> Not worrying about this being zero, we can see that when a ZML goes to infinity, um, what do we get? What do we get here? This becomes negligible, this becomes negligible, cancels out. So, something's not right here. Sorry. Hold on a second. Oh, sorry. I have to be stupid here. So, ZML goes to infinity. This becomes negligible, right? This becomes negligible. We've got this hanging around. So you can easily see, <laughs> easily, I didn't see it, but it's, it's obvious when, that we, we're going to get this. Now, you'll notice it's purely reactive. Why is that? Why don't we have any resistance here? Well, the reason we don't have any resistance is because we don't have any resistance. <coughs> If you go back and look at our model, we have no losses. We're assuming no losses in the pipe. Our, our, mechanic, our, our driver, is, no, there's no losses. Any losses at the end was the in, in termination? No. So the, the impedance here has to be purely reactive. There's no dissipation in our system. Resonance corresponds to the vanishing cotangent of K, KL equal to zero. When you set the cotangent of KL equal to zero, that means the cosine of KL is going to be equal to zero. And that means you're going to get these resonances here. Here's the mathematical statement. We'll look at the, a, a sketch of what these mean. But you get basically that KL has to be a half integral value of pi. Okay, and people usually don't remember this. What they remember is what I'm about to show you. Okay, but before we do that, we need to do one thing. Now that we've found the resonances here. We want to go back and see what the pressure looks like. Okay, now that we found our spectrum, the frequencies here, for which we have resonance, we go back 
And if you look at the expression for u at the boundary, the fact that that has to be zero means that there's a minus sign there. It means a has to be equal to b. You can look back at that a few pages ago. It means that a has to be equal to b. So our pressure becomes, becomes this, okay? And there's an, there's an irrelevant phase constant that I've suppressed here. I've set it equal to zero. So this is what the pressure looks like in the pipe for a rigid boundary connection. Um, all right, and now how do we understand our spectrum here? Well, here it is, here it is. If we look at the acoustic pressure, here's the driving point, here's the terminating point. We have, and we saw this in the, you saw this in the, you saw this in the first experiment. This is a pressure antinode. Okay, it's a velocity node, it's a pressure antinode. You may remember that, okay? So for all of our different resonances here, we'll always have an antinode here. And what we have here, what, this, what our theory, based on a model, is giving us is that it's a pressure node. There's no pressure swing at the driving point. Now, that doesn't seem right. Is that what you observed in the first experiment? No. You observed it was more like, like a node. It was more like a pressure antinode than a node. This is because our driver, the, our model of the driver, it just can't, it's because we have this massless driver with no stiffness and no dissipation. So we will, when we generalize that, we're gonna find a very different picture here. We'll do that at the, um, probably the last, I th the last or the second to the last lecture on this material. We'll do it next week, okay? So anyway, due to our, the model of our driver here, we have uh, <coughs> effectively, this is in introductory acoustics or introductory physics, this is what we get typically for a closed end. This is what you get for an open end. So our system here is behaving like an open end where it's exposed to the, to the atmosphere, where we get this pressure release condition, where there's very little pressure, close to zero pressure. So. In the parlance of, um, you know, introductory acoustics, the, the simple stuff, right? This is looking like a closed, open-end pipe. <clears throat> so we will remove, this is really not right, this is far from typical, but we'll remove that later, later in this chapter. Um, another, <clears throat> another problem here is that we're, we're looking at resonance, right? Which means we have Usually when we think of resonances, we have a drive, right? And we're looking at a steady state response. What's the steady state response here on resonance? It's infinite because we have no dissipation here. So the problem is we're driving this, this is getting to a little bit of the details here, but I, it's in the notes, I might as well mention it. We're driving this in, but our solution here has zero pressure response. So the only way the steady, the steady state that we're going to find here for resonance is it, the math does what it can to, uh, to give you a non-zero pressure here. It goes to infinity. So that's a mathematical perspective. A physical perspective here is that we have no dissipation in our system. And if we drive on resonance, we're pretty obviously going to have infinite response. So we will take care of that later. There's two ways to take care of it. You can introduce losses in the pipe here. Losses in the driver, there's three ways, excuse me, and losses here. Or you could have all three, or any combination. Uh, okay. So that's the simplest termination. The next simplest is an open termination. The standard Elementary, again, this you know, introductory physics approach here for an open end is you've got, you've got sound in this pipe. Here, and we could, we're, we're imagining that we're driving it here. <coughs> and out here, we just have equilibrium pressure. So we have this sound wave here moving along. When it gets to the end here, the sound wave sees this open environment here. The, the simplest representation of what's going on here is that there's a, what we call pressure release, as I've mentioned before, where 
right, right here, there's no acoustic pressure. The pressure is equal to zero. And the idea is that the, 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 wa the wave motion here will diverge out very quickly here. So to a, to a first approximation, what you get here is what you get out here, which is very little pressure sweat. Now we know that that's just a rough approximation. If it were exactly true, you wouldn't hear anything. And you know you're going to hear something. You know there's going to be sound emitted here. But the point is, and it it's, and it's actually can be very dramatic, the sound coming out here is um, at a typically a much smaller amplitude than the sound in here. And in fact, I've read that in musical instruments, it can be extreme. In some, uh, in a trombone, I, I saw an article on a trombone once, many years ago, somebody looking into a trombone. And um, the reason I remember this is, the amplitudes inside the trombone were just huge. They were way up there. I mean, it would destroy your ears. I can't remember how many dB, but it was extremely loud. And I was interested in that because I do a lot of nonlinear wave stuff. And so it, it suggests that very high amplitude suggests that if you want to understand what's going on in trombone, you're going to have, you're going to, have to go beyond the linear acoustics theory inside the trombone there. Now, they have to be careful with that. Often, often what seems very loud to us from a nonlinear wave point of view is, is really not that loud. It's not that nonlinear, okay, when it comes to acoustics in air, when it comes to particularly in air. Well, I guess liquids too. So you need to be careful with that, but it still is, is interesting here. And another way, the standard way that people think of this is there's a huge impedance mismatch here. So most of the energy gets reflected. So that's the perspective that we had in the, you know, it goes back to chapter six, the second chapter, reflection and transmission. <coughs> So at a first approximation, there's no sound here, but clearly that's not going to be sufficient for us. We have to include that. So how do we include it? Well, we'll see. Um, <coughs> so to a first approximation, the setting the acoustic pressure equal to zero here, we're going to get a terminating impedance of, of zero. If you look at the impedance translation formula, go back and set ZML equal to zero, you'll find that the input in, in the dimensionless input impedance is now I times the tangent. Before we got the cotangent, now we're getting the tangent. And resonance corresponds to the vanishing of this. And now it's instead of a half integral number of wavelengths, we're, what this represents is not obvious looking at it, but <clears throat> if you convert the k to wavelengths, what you're going to find here is that instead of a half integral number, we have an integral number of wavelengths. Okay? And I didn't graph that, but you know what it's going to look like. I didn't sketch it. So this... Um, oh, furthermore, I guess I need to say this. Further, before we do that, we need to look at the, what the pressure is doing. Um, <coughs> well, we already did this. Because the pressure is zero here, and because we also found due to our model that it's zero here, the acoustic pressure, what we're going to have is something you all have seen before. This will be down here. So the lowest resonance will be a half wavelength, rather than this. I guess I stated this wrong. This is in, the, what's involved here is quarters. This is a quarter wavelength. I think I stated that wrong, but you can see that. Okay, before. Now what we're going to find is the fundamental here is a, is a half a wavelength. The next one up is a single wavelength. So by flipping our boundary, switching our boundary condition from the one simple case to the other, we've gone to the case where the resonances are now half a wavelength rather than this quarter wavelength thing there. Okay, now for us, this is clearly, this approximation is not good enough. We want to be able to deal with the sound. We have all kinds of theory we can deal with, you know, the power. We know how to deal with this. It may not be evident to you that how we're going to deal with this, but it's actually come up before is once we model 
the fluid here, that we think of it as a piston, we, we can calculate all this. We went through a lot of work to do that. And this is why that baffled piston solution is so important. We're going to be able to apply it to the radiation of sound from an open end. We're going to be able to apply it. So the way we apply it is we set the terminating impedance now equal to the radiation impedance. And we know that we make the assumption, and it's very reasonable here, that the fluid right here, right at the end, is acting like a piston. Right at the end here, it's acting like a piston. It's all uni uh, uniformly moving. That's reasonable. Once we do that, we know the radiation impedance. It's not, we know that it's not simple, except in those two special cases of long wavelength and short wavelength. Remember all that? But we know how to handle it. <coughs> so, um, you might wonder how good is this approximation? Well, it would seem good here, but if you have a necklace Helmholtz resonator, which Steve and I are working on as part of his thesis, okay, I don't know, it looks kind of ugly, or look kind of cartoonish, but let's make it more spherical here. So, we have this cavity of some volume here. We have this neck. And it has no geometrical neck here. However, due to the incorrection, there's going to be some incorrection here. There's effectively a neck. So this has a Helmholtz resonance. You know, if you plug zero neck length, zero geometrical wavelength into the zero geometrical length here of the neck into the Helmholtz formula, you're going to get infinite frequency. But there is an effective you know, because of the motion here, as we discussed, there's an effective link. So you get a Helmholtz frequency, right? Now, if we want to actually calculate this, we have to make an assumption on the flow. Well, the standard thing to do is make an assumption on the flow here. And the standard assumption is right over there. It's thinking of this as a piston. If we make that assumption, then we, we know what incorrection. We know what, how to correct for this, right? Well, you're going to approximate it with a baffled incorrection, like you did in the experiment. But do you think the assumption of a piston is good here? I, that's not so obvious, right? The flow is going to be kind of going back and forth like this. This assumption of a uniform flow acting like a piston may not be, may not be good here. So we're hoping to see that in our data. We're hoping to see that in our data. And there is a theory for this, flow through an orifice. This is called flow through an orifice. It's known, it's ugly, but we may be, we may be dealing with that. We'll just have to wait and see. Uh, so, making the piston assumption, which seems very reasonable here, let me remind you that in the, long, it's, the radiation impedance is simple in the long wavelength and short wavelength limit. The long wavelength limit is what is relevant here, and one of the reasons is, if we imagine a short, short wavelength limit here, we've got a problem. And I've encountered this, it's not a theoretical problem, but it's an experimental problem. You try to drive sound in a pipe with a small wavelength like this, what you're going to find is you're going to excite waveguide modes. It's just unavoidable. Slight asymmetries here, You'll, it'll, it'll be complicated. Right? Now, theoretically, we can imagine we have this perfect plane wave of arbitrarily small wavelengths here, but experimentally, it's not the way it works. And typical applications for sound in pipes is where the wavelength is much bigger than the substantially bigger than the radius or the diameter. So we're, we, we don't have, we only have the longitudinal waves, we don't have the waveguide modes where there's stuff going across here. So we use this approximation and we derive this in that famous chapter seven, right? That's sort of the main part of the course here, the, the sources of sound, right? We, this is the radiation impedance of a baffled piston in the long wavelength limit. There it is. It has a resistive part, and it better have a resistive part. That's the whole point here. We want to be able to calculate the energy coming out of here, the acoustical energy. And it has this reactive part. Um, now, you'll notice here, because it holds for, to a first approximation, Ka is equal to zero here, because lambda is much greater than A. But this is going, this is the next, uh, this is the lowest order real part. The lowest order resistive part is one half Ka squared. The lowest order reactive part is, goes, like K, goes like Ka. 
if you want higher orders, you need to go to the, that exact solution, remember? This is the long wavelength approximation. So here's what we do. We set, put this into ZML, put it in the impedance translation formula, and make the approximation that Ka is less than one. You don't want to set it equal to zero, because then we're going to end up with the elementary, the no radiation. <coughs> so we're not going to do that analysis, but it's in the book. And here's what you get when you put, do what I just said, put it in the impedance translation form. And look, and look for resonance. We're looking for resonances here. So you set the imaginary part equal to zero. And by the way, do we have a res any resistance here now in our system? Where is it? Do you see it? The radiation is resistant. That's energy that's going away. It's not coming back. So we're going to have a real, the input mechanical impedance will have a resistive part and a reactive part. We set the reactive part equal to zero, and we find the spectrum, the, the, the spectrum of resonance frequencies. It looks like this, which, you know, I don't, I can't, I have no idea what's going on here. But when you actually convert, use omega is equal to CK, convert it to frequency, look at this. Now this is a really good, this is a really nice expression here. In the limit of very long wavelength, okay, we're going to get, we get this. This is just the spectrum for Ka equaling zero. It's very easy to show, which we were just talking about there, okay? So this is the elementary spectrum, the introductory acoustic spectrum, okay? And you can see that the way, the way people think about this, the natural way, and you know it's coming, is that there is an end correction here. Okay, and here it is really more of an end correction. We encountered this in Helmholtz resonators. But here, I don't know, it's just more dramatic because we tend to think of long pipes here. The pipe has some geometrical length here, but acoustically it, obeys, it'll, it, it um, behaves as if that length were a little bit longer. Okay, typically this is, typically this is gonna be much greater than this. So, we have this effective length, and here's the incorrection. And that's the famous Rayleigh incorrection uh, for a baffled in. This is now for a baff, we're talking about a baffled in, right? Because that can be readily calculated. Uh, okay, what about the more common case of an unflanged pipe where you don't have that baffle? Well, we know how to handle that. We just use what's in the literature, right? That turns out to be a complicated expression, that, complicated to handle that. So we just stated the results in the past. So for an unflanged N, the N correction is less. And it's less because when we have this flanged in here, the flow here, the flow in and out, is more directional, it's more, conf it's, it's more, it's more directional in, this, in the ax direction of the axis here because of this baffle. When I remove the baffle, the flow will diverge and converge more quickly. So there's, effect there's less of effective incorrection here. And you can see it in the math. This is 0.85, this is 0.61. Uh, here it is, 0.61. Okay, it's difficult to come up with this number. In fact, KFCS, you know, it's interesting. They only do it to one figure. If you look in the book, I, I've mentioned this to you in the past, I may have forgotten. They have 0.6. But if you dig into the literature, um, you'll find that to the next figure is a one. Uh, okay. So that's it for now. Anybody have any questions? We're next, we're, uh, we can now utilize a lot of the stuff we've established this quarter into looking at the radiated sound field here. Yeah. The, uh, the initial theory we talked about at the very termination of the pipe pressure falling to zero, and that was incorrect because then there wouldn't be any sound coming out. Right, that's so too, too we're going too far in the approximation. Right. But the, again, the, the actual sound coming out here is weak. Here. It's weak compared to the amplitude in here. Go ahead. Is the end correction then pushing that pressure equals zero point out? Is that kind of what the... Oh, um, yeah. Yeah, you can think of it that way. 
You know, what's actually going on is it's, it's, it's continuous here, okay? And there's this transition region taking you from this nice planar sound wave here to uh, a, a diverging sound wave with a lot less intensity than what's in here. So this is, there's this transition region here. And that's all in that length correction. So the idea of the length correction is you're converting something to, you're making it, um, you know, you're simplifying. It's a simpler way of looking at it where you've pushed all these complications under the rug or something. It's all buried in that effective length. Okay, any other questions? Okay.